Bueno, muchísimas gracias a, a todos por eh, acompañarnos. Esta conversación, al igual que la anterior, la vamos a hacer en idioma inglés. Entonces, luego de estas palabras introductorias, eh, vamos a pasar a materia con, con nuestro invitado aquí, eh, James McAndrews, que viene desde los Estados Unidos. Eh, bueno, Jimmy eh, es ex directivo, investigador y ha tenido responsabilidades en el Banco de la Reserva Federal de, de Nueva York. Desde entonces ha emprendido también proyectos tanto académicos, de investigación, como proyectos eh, prácticos. Eh, ya nos contará con más detalle, pero está creando un banco en los Estados Unidos que pueda tener acceso a eh, el Banco Central. Y así como aquí, tener, abrir una cuenta en el Banco Central es toda una aventura que tiene un montón de aristas y, y vamos a aprender de esa parte. Y de un capítulo de la historia eh, de los Estados Unidos que fue cómo lograron las uniones de crédito, las uh, entidades de ahorro y, y préstamo de los Estados Unidos en los ochentas, lograr que les, cuen, les abran cuentas en el Banco Central. No siempre fue así. Y, y vamos a, a conversar sobre esto. ¿okay? Entonces, desde este momento me, me paso el inglés. Este, so, do you want to uh, give some initial uh, thoughts or perhaps sí. a bit of background? questions come on no uh, ex, um, my voice is a little bit worse today <clears throat> pero uh, muchas gracias uh, grace y roberto y uh, a mux y la cámara de la gente muchas gracias es un placer estar aquí en, en méxico pero voy a continuar en inglés <laughs> So I have some, I have some slides. <clears throat> I have some slides that tell the story of how in the United States, credit unions and savings and loans were fully integrated into the U.S. system of financial uh, inclusion and integration. I think this, um, story has applications to other countries. The reasons why this took place were specific to the United States, but many of the reasons are um, in place in other areas. So if I can have my slides. Uh, so, The story has to do with a major law that was passed in 1980. The law is known as the Monetary Control Act of 1980. Prior to 1980, credit unions and savings and loans did not have access to accounts at the central bank. Now, if you don't have access to accounts at the central bank, The only way you can transfer money across institutions is by having correspondent bank accounts. Correspondent banking accounts, of course, come with a uh, margin of profit correspondent bank and um, also may have other limitations, in particular, two different credit unions may uh, obtain services from two different correspondent banks, so it doubles the number of transfers that have to take place in order for a transaction to be processed. So that's a very inefficient and exclusionary uh, way to provide financial services. What happened in the United States is that in the 1970s, the automated clearinghouse was created. And the automated clearinghouse is uh, now one of the most uh, important payment methods in the United States. Most all wage payments are paid via the automated clearinghouse. 
other payments such as social security and, and pensions are paid via the automatic clearinghouse. So it's a very large scale payment system and it's very large. So the creation of the automated clearinghouse was a um, very unusual <clears throat> process in that it was a uh, it wasn't a partnership necessarily, but there was a um, a simultaneous development within both Federal Reserve and within banks, private banks around the nation, and the automated clearinghouse was uh, organized regionally around the United States in various automated clearinghouse organizations, associations. So um, the banks controlled access to these organizations. If we could go forward uh, a couple of slides. Hmm. The, the key issue with these organizations is they did not allow savings and loan corporations to join the organization. And so a couple of savings and loan organizations associations in order to get access to these associations. And their argument was based on a a uh, very old uh, concept in uh, monopoly, anti-monopoly law, which goes back to 1912 and is called the Terminal Railroad Association case. That was the case decided by the US Supreme Court. In that case, there was a single bridge that crossed the Mississippi River in St. Louis. And a particular railroad company owned that bridge, it would not allow its competitors access to the bridge. The US Supreme Court decided that there was only one bridge across Mississippi River. And there was no practical way to do it. Then that bridge was what they called an essential facility. And if you had an essential facility, then you had to allow your competitors access to that facility on reasonable terms. Consequently, in the case with the automated clearinghouse, the court has decided that the automated clearinghouse was itself an essential facility, that there was no practical way for savings and loans to duplicate nationwide payment facility. Courts ordered the association to be allowed to join the, the uh, regional associations. At that point, the Federal Reserve also allowed savings and loans to join. This was a very important point that then led to the resolution very long-standing uh, issues in the United States. In addition to the creation of the automated clearinghouse, there was, of course, tremendous inflation in the 1970s. With the inflation, the United States had a um, limit on the amount of interest that banks could pay depositors. So depositors could get higher interest rates in government debt and other short-term instruments. And so the shadow banking system began in the United States in the 1970s and banks were losing deposits. Banks were required to hold required reserves at the Federal Reserve. The savings and loans didn't have to hold required reserves, but they couldn't get any payment services from the Federal Reserve. Those payment services were provided to member banks and national banks on a gratis uh, basis for free. So this law in 1980 
solved all these problems. The law said the required reserves are universal across the United States, savings and loans, credit unions, and banks all must hold required reserves. Secondly, the payment services of the Federal Reserve will be open to any depository institution. So all credit unions, all savings and loans, and all banks could obtain services from the Federal Reserve. Third, the services would be priced so that uh, everyone would have to pay a fee for the service. And this was the key law that really <clears throat> the United States uh, financial system. Now in this slide, you can see that in particular, credit unions grew a great deal in the 20 years that followed this law. Savings and loans declined in size, but the reason for that was that there was a savings and loan crisis in the late 1990s. Many of the savings and loans went out of business, but the access to the Federal Reserve by credit unions allowed credit unions to thrive and they continue to thrive in the United States today. So that law established the principle that any depository institution could have accounts at the super bank. Thank you so much, uh, Jamie, for, for that uh, description. I, I want to also talk about my experience in uh, Ecuador. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, when uh, I was at the Central Bank of Ecuador, uh, we set a goal of, we called it democratization of the national payment system. Mm -hmm. And democratization meant literally opening as many accounts as possible. Open the accounts for the homes, credit unions, uh, cooperatives, uh, and the local uh, smaller institutions. And uh, and uh, the what what we tried to do was to uh, change some of the regulatory obstacles so that the smaller entities could open accounts. For example, we found they had to have dedicated fiber mm -hmm. uh, communications between the central bank. Right. The investing in the hardware of dedicated uh, fiber optics was extremely expensive when the technology already allowed for encrypt. We also changed um uh, regular requirements in terms of anti-money laundering uh, you know in the case of credit unions you don't have one shareholder or a few shareholders millions all right and uh, the the files that would have to be provided requirements were going to be large. So we said no, only uh, that have uh, and the uh, directives of the entities would have to requirements. Um, we also found that uh, uh, many uh, smaller entities uh, had difficulties in terms of internet. 
So we partnered with the Ministry of Telecommunications. Oh, uh, to invest in uh, connect to the rural areas. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, uh, we realized that we had built a blood flow system of a, of a and before the blood wasn't reaching all the <laughs> But if if money flows, uh, uh, then all of a sudden we had a, an irrigated system, and we were able to include uh, jump from forty entities that were in the payment system. Uh, from 40 to 600. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a, a huge jump. Now, uh, their next uh, challenge was, uh, hey, now they have an account, but or what are they mm -hmm. gonna use this mm -hmm. for? We, uh, we started to basically, Talk to the government entity that the treasury, just mm -hmm. like we had the morning. And we said, look, now you can pay wages and salaries. There's uh, not just in big bank accounts or, or bank right. accounts. You can have a list of 600 new entities right. that were closer to the place of work government workers were working, teachers, police, military. So they were much closer to their and then G2P payments, so government mm -hmm. uh, where uh, our, one of our foremost uh, incentives right. which is actually similar to what the treasury is the main user really so that's an important role of government of promoting and of course after the credit utility of the payment system then they expanded it to national transactions you know private p2p transactions Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and many. That's an inspiring story. Uh, I thought I would spend a moment um, discussing why access to the central bank is so important for for small for small credit unions and and. Saving societies. Without access to the central bank, credit union uh, is in many cases replaced than a fintech to um, conduct business. A fintech can, in some cases, be, be described as a bank that's run out of a correspondent bank. Uh, it uses technology to provide a small, a small set of services to its clients. And if the credit union doesn't have access to the central bank, the credit union is a bank being run out of a correspondent. So I think this is where, um, the financial aspect of being a depository institution. I have to interrupt you. Hay un concepto que enfatiza Jamie que es es dice un fintech sin cuenta al banco central corre a través de un banco corresponsal. 
Y si en unión de crédito tampoco tiene... Ok. La, la palabra clave es banco corresponsal. Ahí. Corresponsal. Ok, please, please go ahead. Sí. So, um, I think that um, fintechs, um, I think that uh, <clears throat> the requirements and the uh, uh, regulations that apply to depository institutions, um, credit unions, savings and loans, and so on, are uh, are there for a reason, and those institutions have a greater responsibility for um, knowing their customer, anti-money laundering, and so on. And I think that uh, the access to the central bank uh, is, in in most cases, an essential facility. Uh, so it's a an issue that um, has, we took a tour yesterday with a MOOCs and um, and the size of these credit unions is uh, in many cases very small. So if they're getting their clearing services from a correspondent bank, uh, it could be, you know, very expensive just any margin that is charged on top of the costs of doing the business uh, is uh, magnified because of the small scale of these institutions. So I think that <clears throat> access to the central bank is, a, is an extremely important uh, measure for financial inclusion. It may not seem like it is because level, but it's one of the things that can uh, assist. And as you point out, getting payments to government employees in rural areas and things of that sort uh, can be done most effectively uh, through the systems. Me gustó mucho. I really like the analogy that you mentioned uh, as a, an essential facility. You made reference to the historic example of the bridge. Right morning we started the, the, the saying that we want to be that bridge that's right and it, it just uh, comes to show once that, that bridge is an essential facility if we are serious about inclusion right 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 exactly i think that uh financial inclusion If we are to think about it seriously, essentially demands of us that we make sure that depository institutions have the access that they need safely and efficiently transfer payments without a big margin charged by a correspondent bank, who after all is a competitor to, to, the, uh, to the credit union uh, or the case may be. And the, and the other uh, point of reflection about essential facilities and is that most of the time these payments are publicly owned, like the Fedwire, the Spay of Mexico system. It's a public infrastructure right. where taxpayer money went to fund it. Uh, but however, uh, Most of the, the, the payments of the economies uh, seem to be by privately owned rails mm -hmm. uh, uh, or some of the correspondent bank. Uh, so uh, the question is really if have already invested, you know, billions building these uh, facilities. Uh, why is it others are uh, avoiding the the network effects and the uh, and the maximum use and taking advantage of? Oh, it's a very good uh, <clears throat> observation. 
in the United States in the 19th <clears throat> when the automated clearinghouse was created, there was a big debate about whether the Federal Reserve should be involved. And um, the resolution of this debate is still contested today. And the resolution was that the automated clearinghouse run by an association of banks, while the processing, most of the processing would be done by the Federal Reserve. The associations delegated to the Federal Reserve processing of the automated clearinghouse, all except the New York delegate. New York Association. But what this mean, what this meant was that the automated clearinghouse was extraordinarily efficient because it could draw on federal reserves, which 5,000 banks. And that now, of course, we're in an era of new technology and digital technology. And some of the same questions and debates are occurring today. In the United States, the New York Association called the Clearinghouse has created a fast payment service called Real-Time Payments. It has about 260 banks that belong to it. Federal Reserve later this year will um, begin a service called FedNow. And Fed now will have uh, 5,000 banks that can send and receive payments. So it's a, it's a very important question as to whether these uh, bridges that we're building are, are built by the public sector or the private sector. Because um, imagine a, a public road where there are many uh, driveways and intersections can get on the road, get off the road, versus the tollway where there's just one entrance into the tollway and uh, a very high toll on that and it's private. Uh, and it may be a very road according to certain metric, but it's not inclusive. Wow, fascinante. Muchísimas gracias, Jamie. Creo que Hemos cumplido el objetivo de presentar eh, los antecedentes y, y históricos eh, y, y más. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I thank you so much, Jamie. I think uh, we have uh, found our objective. Uh, mm -hmm. We have covered uh, the, the historic political economy and some of the legal elements, accounts and master accounts and the utility, uh, then the essential facility nature of payment. Mm. Mm. Yes. We, uh, um, thank you so much for your uh, uh, presence. So for accompanying us yesterday, our trip. It was fruitful. And we're, again, very thankful to have on you. <clears throat> it's been a pleasure and my honor. Uh, thank you, everyone. Y ahora sí, no sé si me activan para pasar al español o invitamos ya a, a, a más. Gracias. Gracias.